when I have a few projects in Germany, each country, unless you have that accent, patients don't understand you. So then they keep on asking the same question again and again. Uh, so to avoid that, unfortunately, when we are there, we have to speak a little bit like that. And I came back to India in 98. I was there uh, away from India for 18 years. And then I was in uh, Canada doing my FRCP at, in Edmonton. And then I came to Detroit actually, where I became a professor of psychiatry. But I'm really not a psychiatrist. I'm heavily into non-invasive cardiology. Uh, this uh, topic, which is uh, titled as psychological uh, aspect, uh, Actually, it's Renoir. That's a French word. It's Renoir. But then, does that make any difference? No. Ultimately, you know, if you understand who it is, who if I understand who that is, that will be sufficient for the audience. And basically, you know, what I'm trying to tell you is, uh, in life, we all undergo through a lot of stress. A student has stress. Because I see a lot of uh, students with examination phobia. They study a lot. On the day of the exam, they completely black out. And then they don't even understand the multiple choice questions. Let alone the answer. They, they would have known the answer, but if you don't understand the question, what can you do? There will be very little that can be done. And that I treat a lot of patients like this. I treated quite a few, even using hypnosis at one time, which I don't believe in it now. And uh, take for example, the doctor's example. Uh, Dr. Philip put it very, very correctly. In, in the US, it doesn't happen here, but in the US, when uh, you're sitting with a psychiatric patient, I always sit near the door and have the patient sit there. If the patient is going to attack me, I can run first. <laughs> this is not an exaggeration. I have ra run three times for my life. <laughs> Once in Detroit, twice in Dayton, Ohio. So, Dr. Philip, whatever you said is correct. <laughs> and then again, uh, we have, so, you know, so many professions are there. These are all very relevant to rheumatoid arthritis. A bank employee, you know, who to count notes, a typist, a pianist, for example. This is a, this is a very sad uh, example. I have seen quite uh, about maybe three, four pianist uh, patients who had rheumatoid arthritis. And then suddenly, this was their bread and butter, and suddenly everything is lost. So, what ha happens here is, does the stress come first? Does rheumatoid arthritis come first? If you go back to Freudian times, I don't believe in psychoanalysis, so please forgive me. <laughs> and I'm happy I don't believe in it. According to the old generation theories, it's all blaming your father, blaming your mother for what happens to you later on in life. It may be true to a certain extent, but not autoimmune diseases, but not schizophrenia. Parents do not cause that. Parents may be strict, may be obsessive. They can make children fearful. Children may get anxious sometimes. There can be a clash of personalities. But with illnesses like autoimmune diseases, hypothyroidism, SLE, systemic vasculitis, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, all these things, majority of these as we know, they are genetic illnesses. And this is again, you know, stress before marriage and after, you can see. Everyone goes through these things. And when this happens, particularly to patients, my patients, why I got interested into, in stress actually was the connection between anxiety, depression, and sudden cardiac death. And in this connection, we have been working in this area since 1985-86. And uh, now we have a few predictors. That's what I was uh, 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 speaking with Dr. Handa a few minutes ago. He mentioned about the cardiac side effects. That is my specialty actually, about the side effects of medications, 
about non-invasive predictors of what might happen with the blood pressure, with the QT interval. Right now we are one of the leading uh, uh, people working on QT interval variability which is a marker for sudden death. And this all has relevance to autoimmune diseases. If you see any illness can produce stress, any chronic illness, any chronic injury, any chronic pain, and it can be diabetes, it can be hypertension, it can be rheumatoid arthritis, right now we are talking about it, and it can be SLE. And how stress is mediated, I don't want to go too much in detail because the people that are sitting in front of me, some of them are the experts in this area. To a large extent, it is a CRH that needs to be blamed. And then eventually, it is a cortisol that produces quite a bit of increase in sympathetic function and the end organ damage. And the end organ damage is directly linked to all the different kinds of endothelial dysfunction in the vessels in different parts of the body. So ultimately what does stress do actually? There will be a cardiovascular dysregulation, then then changes in cerebral blood flow and uh, stress produces what is anxiety, what is depression, what is stress. Stress is nothing but, like say for example, if I lose 10,000 rupees on the road when I am walking, I may not feel bad about it if I am rich enough. Whereas if a person's monthly salary is 10,000 rupees, if he loses that 10,000, immediately he goes through tremendous amount of stress. What we are talking about here is, stress has environmental influences and a genetic predisposition, there is a genetic diathesis. For example, Dr. Chandrasekhar and I, we can probably tolerate lot of stress because we go back and forth, uh, I collaborate with him, we, we are uh, working on some immunological uh, IL-4, TNF-alpha, psychological stress and all that. And then sometimes he asks me to do things that I cannot do. Then am I going to break down and get a panic attack or anxiety attack, am I going to be depressed? But then I might if my stress level threshold is low. So different people have different thresholds. And people should be able to take life easy if the, 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 the threshold is high. That is what is important. That is again genetically determined. And then the metabolic syndrome, which is very, very important. Most of the autoimmune diseases now, uh, we know that they are associated with metabolic syndrome. The hallmarks of metabolic syndrome is, one is hypercholesterolemia. The second one is insulin resistant diabetes, obesity and ultimately all these things lead to coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease finally ending in myocardial infarction and sudden death. And this is only, I wanted to touch upon a couple of things about the autoimmune diseases, especially rheumatoid arthritis, one has to look at, if you are looking at what are the, what is the psychological impact actually? Why is the patient getting anxious? Why is the patient, patient getting depressed? The pre-morbid psychiatric function is very, very important here. Say for example, if there is a patient before developing rheumatoid arthritis, if he or she already had anxiety, it is only automatic that once the illness surfaces, there will be more anxiety. And this is common sense point of view. Psychoanalytic uh, psychiatrist doesn't have to tell you, uh, your uncle can tell you, your priest can tell you. So to that extent, I don't want to take any credit about any of that. So th these are simple issues actually. And those are made into textbooks, believe it or not. And that's what bothers me about some of the unnecessary psychological stuff and in-court psychiatry. 
But then the losses due to rheumatoid arthritis are very important. Like uh, when I mentioned about the PNS, when you see your patients, you have more, many more examples. That really, really bothers me. Because when they cannot function the way that they functioned before, it is a big loss to their personal self-esteem. Then it's a big loss to the family. Then there's an economical impact and there's a social impact. And then on top of that, what do we have here? Comorbid psychiatric illness. Now, quite a few studies have shown that depression is, uh, occurs almost anywhere from 13 to 50 percent of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Is that any surprise at all? No. And also all the medications that uh, you were all mentioning, uh, the Maxicaps and all these new drugs, the, everything has its own side effect. To just mention one, for example, indo indomethacin. Indomethacin can produce a serious, severe depression uh, when someone takes at a dose of uh, 150 milligrams or 100 milligrams. At low doses, it may not. And NSAIDs, uh, several people talked about. NSAIDs are a uh, uh, lot of interest to me because we did uh, we did look at the heart rate variability and QT variability during treatment with NSAIDs. They do increase the QT interval variability, which is actually uh, not such a great thing for the heart. I will just come back to that in a few minutes. I am also getting time conscious. I belong to type A behavior and uh, I think I have taken about 12 minutes already. And here only one point I want to highlight is women, I think you all agree with me, are more, more commonly afflicted with rheumatoid arthritis. And so is the case with depression. Whether it is reactive depression, whether it is endogenous depression, as we call in our diagnostic system, whether it is ICD or DSM, we call it major depressive disorder. So there is a link actually between sex, the gender rather, and the disease. And why is that so? Several studies, both on the autoimmune side and both in psychiatry, they have, and also in cardiology, they have tied all these things together to hormonal levels. Estrogen and all the relatives of the estrogen molecule are cardioprotective. That is the reason until the age of menopause, women are almost half as likely as men to die suddenly to get a heart attack. But after the age of menopause, the ratio becomes one to one. This is such an important point people have to bear in mind. And this probably also helps people evaluate the side effects and to try to treat the patients better later on, whether it is a premenopausal or a postmenopausal thing. And this is just a joke actually. This is just a joke because this is supposed to be a classic rheumatoid arthritis personality which has been described by in some sub psychologists and some psychological theories. Self-sacrifice, masochism. You know, when you know that this disease is, you know, it is a biological illness, you are not trying to really be masochistic. You, you, you don't want to walk like this purposefully. Uh, there may be an occasional histrionic patient for secondary gain who might do that. But that is a very rare thing. And to go back into history, a lot of people used to believe during Freudian era that people were actually faking symptoms. And then at King's College London, they have done a fantastic study, Elliot Slater, who is the, one of the authors of textbook of clinical psychiatry, which is a standard book all over the world even today. In his study, what he has shown is people who were dubbed as histrionic, he followed them about, uh, for about 15 years. And then what he found was, out of 863 patients, 85 patients died of either brain tumor or lung tumor or some organic cause. So never, never, never please say if the patient is not improving, he has a psychiatric problem. 
that is one thing I want to stress upon here only the one important point I want to make is osteoarthritis patients versus rheumatoid arthritis patients this, there, there are two systematic studies which show that the impact of anxiety is much more on rheumatoid arthritis patients compared to osteoarthritis patients and the reasons are not very clear but I think probably it is related to the amount of dysfunction well, some of you might uh, make a comment on that later on and this is a very interesting phenomenon I just uh, when I was uh, reading about all these illnesses there are a lot of autonomic influences which are linked to the psycho neuro immunological uh, system after denervation the arthritic limbs may improve some studies show that actually and rheumatoid arthritis may be less severe or not occur in hemiparetic patients I would like comment yes, yes I would like a comment from the audience because I am not an expert but uh, when I read these uh, uh, articles it tickles me you know this because I am interested in autonomic nervous system the vagal and sympathetic I, I'll tell you why I am so preoccupied with the vagal and sympathetic and I already talked about it about depression and uh, guilt and all you know it likes we all feel guilty whether I am depressed or not if I do something uh, that is not uh, making my daughter happy I will have some guilt you know likewise any person who has a chronic illness always goes through guilt feelings because he or she is not able to fulfill either kitchen work or outside employment so that is nothing really to be talked about and the pain correlating with depression is a very very interesting phenomenon because as uh, some of our esteemed colleagues know here in depression my friend Mace has done a lot of work actually with uh, the immunological uh, factors and then he has shown there is increased susceptibility to infection during major depression why is that so because the, your immune tolerance is decreased and there is a reason for it it is not just psychological it is directly affecting the immunological system and uh, later on uh, if Dr. If Chandra wants to clarify that he can clarify that And the only thing I want to touch upon is steroids uh, because Dr. Chansekar actually talked about a case where he gave up to 120 milligrams and occasionally we do see in liaison psychiatry, consultation liaison psychiatry, again uh, ICD syndrome so <laughs> uh, here we say consultation liaison, uh, they, they, they say liaison so I'm <laughs> <laughs> you made me very very self-conscious <laughs> and they can cause anywhere from hypomania to mania to depression and depending upon the dose depending upon how long uh, the people take the medication for and finally here uh, cardiovascular illness the incidence of cardiovascular illness cardiac morbidity, mortality, sudden death, they are all increased in anxiety, depression, schizophrenia which is a psychotic illness and the same is true with autoimmune illnesses and one word I want to include here is we are working on actually subclinical hypothyroidism where you don't see any symptoms of hypothyroidism but there are only minor increases in TSH level those patients and now there are two monumental studies that came out even though they don't have clinical symptoms of uh, hypothyroidism you put them on levothyroxine the vessels improve actually when I talk about it the vessels improve how do we measure it I am just going to mention it in brief
and I don't want, need to expand on this and this elevated homocysteine levels it, it is well established with SLE and right now a couple of my friends are doing studies in India actually Lashmikant is doing one in Hyderabad uh, looking at uh, homocysteine levels in rheumatoid arthritis why is this important? homocysteine is an independent marker of cardiovascular problems uh, not only in rheumatoid arthritis patients in any, any person and then why is it important? Uh, Dr. Chansekar's lab does it. I, I know that uh, J, Dr. Jairam, he does it and I done diagnostics. I don't know how many labs, many, not many labs do it. It is so important because if you see that there is an increase in homocysteine, we can give folate and decrease it. So that is why from a preventive aspect these are very, very important. And this already Dr. Handa has touched upon, I am not going to repeat it. This is something that caught my attention. You know, in rheumatoid arthritis, there is an incidence of premature cardiac deaths. And that was linked to a gene DRB01, in which rheumatoid arthritis onset is above 60 years and DRB 401 or 404 gene and the onset is under 40 years. In both, the cardiac risk is high. In, in some, the younger deaths are common. In the elderly, anyway, they already are at risk for other, with other factors. So that there also it is quite common. So the, what uh, that article actually says is the additive effect of various genes increases the clinical severity and ultimately resulting in cardiac mortality. And this is all linked to endothelial dysfunction. And I am not going to touch upon uh, these too much. Uh, we all know what depression is. The common symptoms are people cannot sleep or sleep too much. Cannot, they don't have appetite or they eat too much. And then they feel uh, hopeless. They feel suicidal sometimes. And then these are all our studies where we have shown that anxiety, depression, all these things are linked to cardiac illness. And this is what I want to touch upon because Dr. Handa was uh, talking to me and he said it uh, in the talk, there are no simple measures to find out who is at risk and who is not. Now we have newer measures. One is beat to beat heart rate variability. Another one is beat to beat QT variability. And then beat to beat blood pressure variability, respiratory regularity and QRS amplitude variability on the ECG and the pulse wave velocity. These are all non-invasive markers and uh, we do it at uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar's place. I have uh, placed my equipment and then uh, we have been doing research before. Now we are implementing it clinically. A normal person has to have an increase in heart rate variability. The increase is because there is an increase in vagal function when you look at the autonomic system. The vagal system, usually when you look at yogis, the vagal system predominates and the sympathetic system actually is downgraded. Whereas, in conditions of excitement, in conditions like in hypertension, the, there is a sympathetic predominance and the vagal system actually is not dominant. And these can be altered with yoga, exercise, pranayama and different medications and that is why these non-invasive markers are important. QT variability increases when sympathetic activity increases. Blood pressure variability increases when sympathetic activity increases. Respiratory regularity signifies vagal influence, vagal predominance. If respiration is irregular, it signifies sympathetic dysfunction. And then QRS amplitude, if it increases, the variability is increased. When I say variability, this is from beat to beat. And that is an, another important non-invasive marker. And the pulse wave velocity, finally, I just want to take two minutes on that. The Framingham study originally conducted in Connecticut, uh, they had thousands of patients in these studies. They have still they are publishing articles from that. What they have shown is, 
It is the velocity with which blood flows from the heart to the brachium, part to the ankle. And then you arrive at an index called brachial ankle pulse wave velocity. It is directly correlated to atherosclerosis. And this Peter, why I am talking today is, we already, I have had an interest to look at that in rheumatoid arthritis. We are doing it. We are planning to do it in a big way. The few patients we have seen, the, and that gives us an arterial stiffness index. And that goes up in these patients. And the same thing happens in our anxiety patients, diabetic patients, hypertensive patients. But these indices can go up even when there is no hypertension. The pulse wave velocity can be increased even when there is no hypertension. The blood pressure may be only 130 over 90 or 130 over 88. But still, looking at the arterial stiffness index, we can predict this patient may be in for hypertension later on. This patient may die suddenly of a heart attack later on if there is an increased QT interval variability. Now we can quantify all those things. Unfortunately, these things have not taken off in India yet. In Germany, in many centers they do it. Canada, in some places they do it. US, in some places they do it. Not all the places. But in India, you know, I am really proud to say that uh, we are able to do it and then uh, at least caution a few patients. And I think uh, that that is one thing I am happy to share with you here. So again, you know, to summarize the whole thing, we need uh, the sympathovagal balance. The vagal predominance is, it goes with health, like in pranayama, with yogis, and when people are in extreme states of relaxation. And the sympathetic system, when it overreacts, people are in the flight, fight reaction, and their cortisol, everything goes wrong, all the immunological parameters. And this I already mentioned. And, and management, I am not going to talk about it. You know much more. A psychiatrist, when he sees a rheumatoid arthritis patient, if the patient has depression or anxiety, we can, some people need psychotherapy, goal-oriented psychotherapy. Some people need medication. Among the medications, the antidepressants, there are so many antidepressants. Unfortunately, the newer antidepressants, which don't have side effects, the SSRIs, may not be that effective. Some, uh, the previous ones are tricyclics like emitriptyline, Effexor, which is uh, venlafaxine. Those are more useful according to some studies. But the studies are far too few and we cannot make any uh, definite conclusions. And finally, I just want to say stress is no exception. Uh, and rheumatoid arthritis is no exception to stress. It goes both ways. And uh, I'm sorry if I took a little longer. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? They are all relaxed now, psychologically, so there are no doubts. Thank you.